Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Chow. I am the postdoctoral fellow in Asian American theology here at Princeton Theological Seminary. It is my distinct privilege to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Russell Jung is professor and chair of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University, home of the largest Asian American Studies department in the country. Professor Jung will be lecturing on the topic, Lessons from 50 Years of Asian American Studies for Asian American Theology. Now, 2019 saw the year-long commemoration of the student protests and strikes that took place 50 years ago at San Francisco State. It would heed us well to, to reflect upon the significance of these revolutionary times in 1968 to 69. And so my introduction of Professor Jung proceeds by way of a brief historical remembrance. This is a quote from Gary Okahiro's Third World Studies. Third World Studies began in 1968 at San Francisco State College as a revolutionary student movement led by the Third World Liberation Front. For democracy's sake, the Third World Liberation Front declared U.S. higher education must address the masses, as well as the ruling elites who predominate in the textbooks and courses peddled by the academy. As a corrective, the Third World Liberation Front proposed a third world curriculum, which was later known as ethnic studies. The student protests and strikes called for an education that was relevant and accessible to the communities from which Asian Americans, African Americans, Latin Americans, and Native American students came. The fight for ethnic studies was a call for an education relevant to contemporary social problems where they could learn to develop effective strategies for social change. Students involved in the Asian American movement challenged the existing white-black dichotomy of the US race relations that rendered Asian Americans mostly invisible to the broader society. Being neither black nor white, Asian Americans became conscious of their marginalized status as unequal racial minorities. They came to embrace a pan-ethnic identity as Asian Americans to reject the connotations of the oft-used group term oriental. To be oriental was to be traditional, objectified, and foreign. In contrast, the newly minted group identity of Asian American signaled a political and cultural collectivity with new possibilities and shared aspirations. Asian American theology shares similar aspirations as Asian American studies in creating a theological curriculum relevant to and representative of the now fastest growing racial demographic in America. Not only are Asian Americans the fastest growing racial demographic, but according to the 2012 Pew study entitled Asian Americans, a Mosaic of Faiths, 42% of Asian Americans identify as Christian. This amounts to roughly 9 million Asian American Christians based on 2016 census data. To put this 9 million figure in perspective, there are 1.35 million PCUSA members and roughly 4.3 million Presbyterians total in the US. Not only is Professor Russell Jung a leading scholar in Asian American studies, but he is also an expert on Asian American Christianity. Professor Jung further studies non-religious Chinese in the United States. He is the author of Sustaining Faith Traditions, Race, Ethnicity, and Religion Among the Latino and Asian American Second Generations, and Faithful Generations, Race, and New Asian American Churches, he also co-produced the video documentary, The Oak Park Story in 2010, about his organizing work in the Latino and Cam Cambodian communities of Oakland, California. In 2016, Professor Jung published his spiritual memoir, At Home in Exile, Finding Jesus Among My Ancestors and Refugee Neighbors about his life and ministry in East Oakland. And 2019 was a fruitful year, as Professor Jung co-authored, Family Sacrifices, which some of us have, have read and discussed, uh, The Worldviews and Ethics of Chinese Americans with Oxford University Press, and co-edited Mountain Movers, Student Activism and the Emergence of Asian American Studies. Without further ado, please welcome Professor Russell Jung. 
<laughs> okay, thanks, David. I appreciate the introduction. And uh, um, thank you for letting, I actually invited myself here to Princeton um, because David's classes are the only people who actually read my books and I feel very welcomed here. And whether you like it or not, you're the only ones who actually pay slight attention to what I have to say. So thank you for uh, inviting me and it's good to be here and to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, actually, I want to start off with how many of you guys have actually taken ethnic studies? If you could raise your hands. So only like five of you. So I'm going to talk today about ethnic studies and its intersection with theology. But um, for those of you who don't or haven't taken ethnic studies, you probably don't even know what it is. So maybe people who've taken it, can you describe what you think ethnic studies is or why a place like Princeton might want to have it. So whoever raised their hands and took an ethnic studies class, what was it? Okay, and your name is, sorry? Courtney. So Courtney says there's a, it's a framework to help analyze literature that's different from uh, Okay, so somehow it's a different framework for analyzing things. Okay, thanks. Others? And your name, please? Anna. Anna. Okay. So Anna says it's it's for um, at least at the uh, K through 12 level. It's understand your own culture because that's absent in a lot of American public education. Um, it's also like a check off a general education requirement just so that you feel like you have some token sense of diversity and multiculturalism, right? So it's sort of this sort of politically correct thing to do just to learn about something that's non-white which is sort of the whole world, mostly. And actually, <laughs> anything white is sort of the minority. OK, anybody else? Anybody take Asian American studies? OK. I was an American studies major. Ah, OK. So um, because of what American studies is, a lot of the things that you study fall under the umbrella of American studies. But in terms of just the interdisciplinary way to look at what it means to be an American. OK. So it's an interdisciplinary way of looking at what it means to be an American. And so, it, uh, well, that's what American studies does. It focuses on being American. But there are other ways of being American than, again, the dominant majority approach. OK. But has anybody taken Asian American studies? Okay, so you took a class. And what did it focus on? Um, was it a literature kind of class? Was it, a, or is it interdisciplinary? It was, it was <laughs> okay, well, I, I guess it's really different in California. So um, like Anna said, it's, it's going to be a requirement in high school to take ethnic studies. So um, it's going to be the wave of the future. Um, other states are looking at it. So if you ever like, want to get out of ministry and want to become a teacher, this is actually a good thing to study and to know about. So let me tell you about what ethnic studies is and sort of share with you um, why students founded it 50 years ago. <clears throat> okay. 
So 50 years ago at San Francisco State, um, we had the longest student strike in American history. It lasted six months. And of course, um, in the 1960s, there were a lot of movements at the time. There was the anti-war movement. There was the women's movement. There was the environment movement. There was the free speech movement. And there was the civil rights movement and the black power movement. So um, students at that time were pretty militant, or they were used to militant language and militant activities. And um, on the campuses, they also wanted to make their campuses relevant to the movements of the time. A lot of them were trying to resist the draft. A lot of them wanted um, to have more accessible education. And Asian Americans at the time were also coming to school and realizing um, that they were involved in these movements, but they were still locked out of most of those movements, that they were disenfranchised in the, in the mainstream um, war anti-war movement. They would want to be like Black Panthers, but Black Panthers said, start your own group. So Asian Americans realized at the time that they needed to start their own group. And they, as they got together on campuses, they realized that um, Filipinos, Chinese, Japanese were the largest groups at the time, that they actually had a lot in common. That, they were, that most of them at that time um, grew up in working class communities where their parents were underpaid. Most of them um, never heard about their own histories or their own cultures in their curriculum. Most of them came from neighborhoods that were being redeveloped in the city. And so um, these Asian Americans coming together with the same class background, same generational status, where they all spoke English and didn't know their ancestral languages, um, felt connected and had a sense of solidarity in which they wanted to be part of those larger movements, but also found that they were locked out. And so they came together as Asian Americans. So um, could someone read this quote? Um, Bonnie, since you're right in the middle, please. And I know your name. So these were um, two of the students who were in part of the Asian American movement at San Francisco State. And Dan Gonzalez is still teaching at our college today, 50 years later, when the student strikers became faculty. And um, so they wrote this. And the first thing you'll notice is, um, is that they wanted an interdisciplinary study. They wanted to study Asian American history, culture, and communities, and to be considered legitimate. And again, they had a high sense of being locked out, disenfranchised, absent from the curriculum. Um, they wanted to learn about their communities so they could go back and help their communities, but they found nothing in the curriculum. Um, they also, as you can see in the second paragraph, wanted a change in the focus of college, that it would be um, for the communities and not for the individual. So this is a big paradigm shift in thinking about what education should be. That education isn't for the individual to move up and to move out of a low-income neighborhood. Education is actually primarily for the community, not for the individual. Think about that. Education is to help focus on affecting social change for a local community. <clears throat> it's not for the individual. Can't, I, I know you can't even think in those ways. It's like, what are you talking about? It's not for the individual. I'm like, where's the app for that? They wanted the college to serve their communities, um, not to take students out of the communities. So this was a major focus for the students and for um, the third world movement um, in those times. They had a strong sense of solidarity with the broader third world of developing nations, um, of marginalized, um, low-income communities. And they saw and recognized the twin evils of the time. For those students, it was racism and imperialism. And recognizing and living in the midst of racism and imperialism, they recognize that the university as an institution needs to deal with those issues. So I love this picture. This is a picture of a high school girl. She cut class to um, attend a memorial for a Black Panther. So students were so um, 
militants so connected at that time. Um, you could see her fist raised. I just love this picture. She was a high schooler um, for Bobby Hutton um, at the memorial um, for Bobby Hutton, who was killed by the police. So they went on strike, and um, <clears throat> they were tear gassed. Um, they were put in prison. Um, people were deported for being involved in the strike. Um, but what happened after six months is that the teachers union also joined in the strike. Um, there was when um, the police started beating and um, harassing the students, and a lot of the community members came and supported the students and joined the picket lines. Um, I'm looking into how the church supported the strike. Um, a lot of the, actually the immigrant parents would come out on the picket lines as well to protect their own kids. And so after six months um, at San Francisco State, they decided to actually um, concede to the 10 demands of the Black Student Union and the Third World Liberation Front. And one was to start the College of Ethnic Studies, precisely so they could actually have classes and have a research agenda that um, helps promote community empowerment. Um, so what, what started at San Francisco State, at the same time, it went down to Berkeley, and Berkeley had strikes at the exact same time. And students were circulating all around the West Coast, and so they went to UC, um, UCLA as well. So the book we have, Mount Movers, is a collaboration of UCLA, UC Berkeley, and San Francisco State about our common origins and our common story together. So that was the start of ethnic studies. It was um, a group of students who were fighting racism and imperialism had this ideological perspective that um, America is part of the first world oppressing the third world and wanting to work in solidarity with others, um, they wanted to actually make change in their own local communities. Does that make sense to you guys? Can you connect? Can you relate? Okay. So what developed then was actually Asian American studies in the community. So uh, Isaac, can you read the first paragraph? Right, and so Harvey Dong is another student striker. He's still now in faculty at UC Berkeley, and so we, um, so these strikers are still around. And again, the the idea of serving the people and learning from the masses was a, a Mao Zedong, um, um, the little red book quote. And so Mao and like Che Guevara, um, nationalist leaders from the Third World were were sort of models for the students. And so they wanted to also serve the people. And so here you could see um, a bookstore and a community center um, where students actually took classes in Chinatown. OK, um, could someone over there read the second paragraph? Thanks. So again, back then, um, it was really easy for them to connect their education to marginalized communities because there was marginalized communities were just miles within, they were within the neighborhood of the university in San Francisco. And you know, San Francisco is a small little city, so you could just take a bus and you're in a low income community or in Chinatown. Um, so in Asian American studies, you could take, um, you could take classes and get paid for it. Back then in the um, war on poverty, students were paid to go out and to work in the community. And they would also get units for um, working in the community and doing their community organizing. So from the first class of San Francisco State Asian American Studies, we had all these um, people who eventually became leaders of the community. Um, Fred Lau, who became chief of police in San Francisco, and Anita Sanchez, my mentor, became the civil service director. The current um, president of Cal State East Bay, he was one of the student strikers and in the classes. And then we have um, six other people who became executive directors of nonprofits that started in the 70s and still continue today, 50 years later. These are the leading nonprofit groups in San Francisco, not just leading nonprofits for the Asian American community, they're the leading housing developers, the leading um, health 
organizations, the leading immigrant organizations in the Bay Area, all came out of the 60s and came out of um, ethnic studies at that time. So you could see we were rooted in the community and we developed leaders for the community, um, to, uh, again, to affect change in the community. So I, I, I really appreciate this sort of Marxian, grounded in the community approach. That's why I am still at San Francisco State, um, why I stayed there. And so most of us um, on our faculty consider themselves more like activists than we are scholars. And I'm as proud of my community work as I am of these books. Um, so for example, we continue to do this stuff in the community. Um, two thirds of our students, of our majors are still low income first generation. And we still send them out into the community to do internships. Um, and we, again, just like the nine unit block, we actually give them stipends to go out and to go work in the community. Um, that's really hard for a CSU. We're public state impoverished, you know, we're not like this place. <laughs> we don't even have dry erase markers. We just sort of like use in, uh, faded markers. Um, but um, so we continue to work in the community. So here's an example of our projects. One was refugees actually came to us and asked, can you help do a needs assessment of our community because we're getting overwhelmed by the number of refugees coming from Burma. And so we did needs assessments. We brought our students to do the surveys um, with them. We brought churches to um, members to translate. So here you have a picture of a church member um, working um, and interviewing new refugees. And from that, that, that took three years to collect all the data. And we developed this report. That report went um, to the local and state governments. We found out that refugees were really um, underserved. And so we were able to get over half a million dollars in grants to create health navigators and to create employment programs for refugees. So this is what I'm most proud of more than a work. Um, currently, next week, in fact, we're starting a Vietnamese, um, a diasporic Vietnamese American network. It's going to be based at San Francisco State. Um, State. This is a collection of Vietnamese um, writers and artists. And again, their whole mission is to bring from the margin to the center the Vietnamese American voice. And so we have people in this group are like Viet Nguyen, who won the Pulitzer Prize for The Sympathizer. T. Bui, she wrote um, a graphic novel. Um, this is all I can you remember that book. Any of you guys know that book? Anyway, they're all coming to San Francisco State again to empower and to share their voices. So we are continue to be rooted in the community, to support community groups, and to connect our students with the community. So the whole idea of ethnic studies, from my easy to understand perspective, is that for Asian American studies, it's um, studies for, by, and about Asian Americans. And it's different from a traditional um, discipline like history or even American studies because of why we're doing it, uh, who's doing it, and for whom we're doing it. Okay. Um, so what we're trying to do, why we're doing it, what we're doing it for is, again, the aim is for the community, not necessarily for individual students. Our aim is what are the community's concerns and how can we support the broader community in making change? We continue to want liberation from the twin evils of racism and imperialism because those two twin evils continue to operate and actually really structure a lot of our lives. And back then, it was for third world solidarity to promote this sense of connection, empathy, and concern for others who are marginalized and disenfranchised. Um, what it means to do um, Asian American studies by us, <clears throat> you could have like a non-Asian person talking about and Asian American experiences, or you could have an Asian American providing their own creative expression of what they're going through. And that's a big difference, right? Having an internal perspective of what it's like to be an Asian American or have an outsider's perspective. And so we wanted to have our own voices, our own creative expressions lifted up and acknowledged. Um, at the same time, we wanted to have a decolonized perspective because we know a lot of theories like or studies of Asians were studies of the other right, like an anthropological perspective. And we wanted not 
a perspective we were, where we were objects of study, but instead we wanted to be the subjects of our own understanding of ourselves, right? That makes sense, right, to you guys? And so having that perspective, having an Asian American perspective by Asian Americans, um, you could have a non-Asian write about Asian Americans, and that could be just as legitimate, and you could get just as much learning from it. And you could have an Asian American write about Asian Americans, and that Asian American may have a delegitimate perspective, right? They could write from a colonized perspective or uh, having their own Orientalist perspective. So we would, I would say an, an Asian American perspective is one that is both from the inside um, subjective, but also promoting a decolonized perspective. Thanks. Uh, you get the difference in how these writings can be developed. And finally, um, who's our audience? And what do we want to um, write about? And so again, it's our local issues and concerns, what's going on in our communities, our neighborhoods. We want to provide a perspective of our own history. So you know, a lot of history for Asian Americans about how we're sort of this nameless, faceless horde who've been victimized by discrimination, right? And so, or you could take the story of how, let's say, railroad workers themselves resisted racism and organized themselves and went on strike, right? So there's different perspectives of how you write history. And um, so again, when we write about history, it's from, um, again, the Asian American's perspective of how, again, we're not objects of history and historical context, but we're also subjects and um, history makers. And again, we want to write about the unique perspective. So you could see how Asian American studies, if you develop it well, you could come up with a whole body of work that's really distinct from, let's say, a sociology perspective or an American studies perspective. You guys following me? Can you ever picture any kind of writing like that? Who writes like this? Who? Do you ever have classes where you understand a different group from their own sort of internal perspective? Well, this is what we try to do. So what happened then is, so at San Francisco State, we try to stay true as much as possible to our original mission. But what happens at the, um, the three schools I talked about is that um, we had different concessions from the university. And this is where the institutional structure um, really shaped how ethnic studies was done and led to institutional logics that created different types of ethnic studies. So at Berkeley, every department is expected to be competitive with its peer institutions in the US and across the world, right? So Berkeley is akin to an Ivy League school where they expected to be highly academic, highly theoretical, to be the best, and to actually to be able to um, develop research that would be um, widespread and top of the line. So Berkeley had that agenda, yeah? Right. I think, uh, yeah, so it's, it's gratifying to see Asian and African um, intersections and 
both the differences and the similarities in experiences and colonization. So in Asian American studies, we have, I'll talk about it later, the latest theory is this notion of trans-specific studies, where you have a lot of transnational ties between Asia and the US still, and a lot of Asian Americans experience those transnational ties. So you know, you dance to K-pop, and you, you, know, you watch Parasite over and over and over again to understand your own lived experience. Um, but you also understand that that transnational relationship has power dynamics, right? That certain people are considered refugees and named and legally constructed as refugees so that they have certain rights, whereas other people are considered unauthorized and undocumented, right? And so <clears throat> the relationship between uh, colonizers and the colonized really shapes the transnational lived experience that Asian Americans themselves have. And so that decolonized or the post-colonial perspective is a pretty big theory in Asian American studies now. So Berkeley tries to be the best. They try to be like Princeton. And UCLA had this big uh, research orientation. And what happened is they saw the strikes going on in San Francisco State. They didn't want to have the strikes um, that pushed for so many classes. So they said, OK, we'll just give you money to do research. You don't have to teach them, but just focus on research. And so what happened then is that you have three different schools, universities, all founded at the same time, their ethnic studies department, but they had really different trajectories. So at San Francisco State, again, we're the largest program in the nation. We have 60 courses this semester. We have really specific classes like Asian American sexuality. I teach Asian Americans and environmental justice. We have classes on Filipino American literature, on South Asian diaspora, very, very specific. It's not like intro to Asian American studies, right? It's, we, we don't even have an intro to Asian American studies because it's too big for us, right? We can't make it that small, yeah? Yeah, that's way too broad for us. Yeah. yeah. So by ethnic studies, we, we have, yeah, we have nine requirements at state for undergrads, but they could take every requirement in Asian American studies. They could even do their science requirement in Asian American studies. I don't know. We have a health class where they have to do, you know, statistical analysis and come up with their own research. Yeah. So we're, yeah. So it's not um, just a ghettoized program, but we're trying to infuse ethnic studies across the curriculum. So this whole ethnic studies perspective is sort of required so that you have this sort of alternative education. Berkeley, on the other hand, poor Berkeley, they had leading scholars, Mike Omi, racial formation, you know, but then they didn't really grow because they're so research oriented and theoretical. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> so, so the Berkeley people said, oh, this is a good, this, you know, I showed this to the Berkeley people, they go, oh, this, this makes us look so bad. And I go, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> UCLA has a different model. Their faculty are usually shared. So they're in like social welfare and sociology. And so they have a lot of shared faculty in different departments in English. Um, and so they have a lot of uh, classes um, and a lot of faculty, but they're sort of diffused and not as concentrated, okay? So that's what happened. And then nationwide what happened is that Asian American studies and ethnic studies became more and more institutionalized. And this book by Mark Chang is called The Cultural Capital of Asian American Studies. And this is sort of what Gary Okahiro is writing about. In order to survive as an academic discipline, Asian American studies, according to academic institutional logic had to become more theoretical in, to publish more in order to become legitimate, right? To publish more means to produce more cultural capital, to be more part of the broader discourse within the academic setting. And so they became more focused on gaining footholds within the university, right? You got to publish or perish. You have to become academically legitimate. Your interlocutors are your fellow colleagues within the discipline. And so at places like Princeton or other, Ivy, other institutions that are removed from Asian American communities, 
Your community is the academic community, and that's who you're writing to, that's who you're talking with, and this is where you get your status from, right? Cultural capital provides you that status to be able to continue on. And so Asian American studies became more of a theoretical discipline in order to survive, and they went from the politics of identity, where they were really focused on political concerns of racism and imperialism, to identity politics, concerns of representation. Right? So we need Asian American studies just so that we're represented. Right? We're not the model minority. Disaggregate the data. You know, it's like these sort of representationists. Oh, Crazy Rich Asians was the first Asian American movie in like 50 years. Right? That's all we care about is how we're represented, not about the concrete issues in our communities, because we don't know what the concrete co issues are in our communities, because we don't live with our communities. We live with, in white suburbs. So you know, who, knows, who knows what it means to be Asian American? So what happened, again, is, um, is that Asian Americans were able to get footholds. A couple of Asian Americans were able to get um, tenure. They get published. They're happy, these individual Asian American scholars. They have a couple of students taking Asian American studies, but they remain small and ghettoized, right? Because they satisfied the identity politics requirement. We have a couple of Asian Americans that should satisfy everybody, should satisfy the alumni, and everyone's happy, right? And in the meantime, students are like, we want more Asian American studies. It's like, well, sorry, you got your two faculty. What more do you want? We can't, you know, we can't afford anymore. Um, the problem is that now Asian American studies people, you know, let's say for me, I would be based in sociology and Asian American studies. I'm trying to satisfy tenure for sociology. So I would rather go to sociology conferences and get you know, kudos and praise and recognition from my fellow sociologists. I get higher status for that. Um, I would probably get more tenure, uh, uh, more tenure um, chits by doing sociology because they're better journals. And so getting legitimation from other disciplines, a lot of Asian American scholars, they're like, I like to do Asian American studies, but really, I'm in sociology, and I need to satisfy the requirements for sociology to get ahead. Does that make sense to you guys? And so that's the problem with Asian American studies, is we remain a small little program outside of California and Hawaii and the West Coast. We're just a bunch of little rinky-dink programs trying to satisfy a bunch of Ivy League students who just want to be represented. So now Asian American studies has grown, again, what they're trying to do is the highest professional standard of excellence. Again, there's that institutional logic. We need to be teaching and research. But it's really all about research, right? They say the university is about teaching and research. But for Division I institutions, it's all about the research. And so they provide book awards for the best book because we got to show that we're legitimate, that we're actually publishing. Um, there are a lot of us. There's 192 sessions in the 2019 conference. Um, that means. There's probably like 500 people presenting panels, paper, panel presentations. So there's 500 scholars doing original research on Asian American studies, but only 25 universities offer majors in Asian American studies. So you can see the barriers in, yeah. No, then they go, they, they go into every field. They go, you know, there's humanities people. So Asian American studies is dominated by humanities peoples, cultural studies types, American studies types. The psychologists have all left on their own, and they go to the American Psychology Association and have their Asian American section. The sociologists have pretty much left, and they have their Asian American sociology section in sociology. Um, so if you go to the Asian American studies conference, it's very cultural studies. So what's capping or the glass ceiling that Asian American studies as a discipline is facing is that, again, it's like, how are we intellectually legitimate? You know, like, what, what theories are we producing? What knowledge are we producing that's useful for other people besides Asian Americans? We are not even producing anything new for Asian Americans, right? We're just sort of repeating everybody else's theories and applying it to Asian Americans. There's nothing creative going on. Sorry. <laughs> just to bash Asian American studies. Um, the structure of academic discipline, again, sort of hampers us as people have these sort of dual loyalties, both to their discipline and to Asian American studies. 
The other discipline will always win because that's where they're going to get their tenure. That other discipline is probably more established. That other discipline probably has <clears throat> um, bigger names that you want to attach yourself to. Student demand is sort of there, but students don't know why they want to take ethnic studies. They just want to take it because they feel like I'm invisible. I don't have my story, but they don't really know why, what's the relevance and why they could really use Asian American studies. And again, because of the structural problems, there aren't that many faculty going into it because why go into Asian American studies if there's no jobs into it? Got it? So we have a problem as a little minority ghettoized academic discipline. Now, why do you guys care? It's because, it, especially for Asian American and going to seminary, Asian American theology has the exact same issues, only you're like 40 years behind and <laughs> just wait, you're gonna hit the glass ceiling and realize, why am I bothering studying Asian American theology when there, nobody cares and nobody studies it and it's like, it's irrelevant. <laughs> so let me show you the parallels, okay? Um, Asian American studies founded the 60s movement. Asian American theology actually started in the 70s when a lot of the mainline denominations had a caucus movement, right? So you guys know about that, like Presbyterians and Methodists demanded Asian American caucuses. I just went to the American Baptist caucus and they changed their name to the Asian American Alliance because they thought caucus was too radical and too strident. So they wanted to be more conciliatory. So now we're the Alliance. <laughs> They could be the Rebel Alliance, but they're, but they're not. I think in the Presbyterian Church USA, they, they call it a Korean language Presbyterian, which is at a, at a national level as well. Too. Oh, yeah. So usually perhaps language, language sections within a denomination. Yeah, so you have language groups, and then, but this was actually it used to be a racial caucus. Good for them. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> They're like the diversity officer at a university who are there and have an institutional place to make change if they can. So Asian American studies initially was community-based. Again, it's to change the community. I think Asian American theology was initially church-based. Who knows? <laughs> we weren't there at the time, but someone should do the research on that. Um, we had this anti-racist, anti-imperialist, you gotta be against something, so they were against assimilating into the broader mainstream denominations. What happened is that we were able to establish Asian American programs and centers, and Asian Americans have, what, three Asian American centers in the country now? Again, in Asian American studies, they have shared appointments, they're in, uh, sociology and Asian American studies. I assume it's the same in theology. You would be a Bartian theologian who happens to Asian American, oh, sorry, David. Um, <laughs> isn't that what Daniel Leah Fuller is doing? He's exactly the same, right? It's like, yeah, yeah okay. That's the only thing you could do, <laughs> apparently. Um, we were able to establish the Association of Asian American Studies. Um, there are small little groups in the Academy of American Religion and in Asian American Studies that are religious groups Theology, um, theology groups, and we have this group called Asian Pacific American Religious Research Initiative. If you're interested, so these are both theolo theologians and religious studies people who are coming together this summer at USC. And we've produced about, the scholars in that group um, are both theologians, again, religious people, and we've um, worked together because we're a small little group. Small student demand for each, both groups actually have pretty notable scholars, I think, who are known in the field. I'm pretty proud, like Kwok Pui Lan became president of AAR. Gail Yi is now president of Society of Bible Literature. And it's pretty good, these pretty powerful, fierce women to have as role models. They're great mentors, so you should go to Pan Autumn. Um, and you know, whenever they speak, they give their money to, to seminarians. And they're just amazing women. But again, the problem is that the structural issues of the academy of tenure and um, what's considered legitimate, intellectually legitimate, um, makes it difficult for our disciplines to grow. 
And we have new theoretical developments, um, but I think we have to be a little bit more creative in um, developing our own theories and our own in, you know, indigenous knowledge that is useful both to us, but also could be shared across um, the board. So to wrap it up, we still have some intersections um, between Asian American studies and what I think is the agenda for Asian American theology, is that we're still trying to develop an indigenous Asian intellectual agenda that's not just copying other theories and applying them to our own con context, right? We have to be a little bit more creative. I think this notion of going back to support our local communities and congregation, I think, I, I don't know what theologians do, but I never really understood how they applied to the real world, sorry, and um, like, what it, sorry, does what they write actually help churches and, I don't know. It's sort of like the same thing, take Asian American studies, what's that have to do with like Asian Americans being racially profiled for the coronavirus, you know? What's, what do they say to each other? And maybe they don't talk to each other. And, um, but to create this agenda and to be able to support communities, you need institutional spaces to do so. Um, and so these two things are racial projects, projects to promote um, our communities, and we need institutional space to promote. So I appreciate Princeton's efforts to develop it. Um, we need it both to develop our own understanding, self-understanding of ourselves, and to, again, to support our local communities. So thank you, um, and I'm open for questions.